Esan Nursalahi is an Iranian-American product designer that has helped over 13 hardware products get to market. He is the author of Why Do We Interface and has worked on designing interfaces for the Internet of Things, augmented reality, 3D printing, financial tools, and medical devices and prosthetics. He grew up in the Chicagoland area and now lives and works in San Francisco. In the following mega tour that includes a massive question and answer, Esan gives us a sneak peek into his considerations during the design process. I'm sure you'll agree, the way he thinks about solving problems is both fascinating and empowering. Let's view Esan's presentation now. There's this project I did in the middle of quarantine, so sort of published this August 15, called Wider Interface, and it's sort of this narrative style analysis of design and technology and how they come together. And I sort of called it a, a micro book, and as you can tell, it sort of has some ideas that are a bit inspired, you know, from older technology or a little bit of physical books and a little bit of, of things like, you know, that are a little more interactive, like Obsidian, right? Like as you hover over here, you get a preview. So when I worked on this, I didn't know about Obsidian and it didn't exist when I started this either, because I first gave this as a presentation in 2018. And so this is like a presentation I gave at a really small meetup. and I thought like, oh, there's something more to this presentation. Like I can turn this into something more than just that little presentation I gave. And so I started this in 2018, got to a certain extent, didn't know what my ending was and just sort of got stuck. And that's been a common theme of mine is like, I'll have this really strong beginning and then I'll get stuck. And eventually during quarantine, you know, <laughs> there's enough time where you're just sort of sitting at home frustrated that it was like a good way for me to channel my energy into something. So I use a tool, I can share it, but I use a tool, I mentioned this to Nick, uh, called ReadyMag that makes it really easy to design your own website. A lot of people are familiar with like Squarespace, but think of this as like a website builder where you can like literally move anything anywhere. And since I'm a designer and like pretty familiar with web technology, it's like pretty easy for me to do this. And I have like decent ideas. The hard part is for me, I think to like have this cohesive thing all together. So once I eventually figured out that Obsidian is this thing, I realized like, I wish I had written it in Obsidian. And that was, it felt really tedious to go and try and make it, remake it in Obsidian from scratch. Cause I was like sort of almost done about to publish it when I sort of figured out Obsidian is a thing. And so I didn't end up doing that. But what I've been working on during the course is uh, the open socket microbook, which is another project that I started as this ReadyMag site really polished. And I talked about this a little bit last time, so I'm sort of recapping a little bit, but I want to jump into, I think this is like essentially a copy of what I shared when I last spoke. And I sort of had these sections and I had these like different little notes and things, but it wasn't quite coming together. And there's this archive of like the linear version that I started with. So similarly, like I put together this like linear version that looks ultra polished, like it could be a real thing. But then it just sort of ends at a certain point. And I think I shared that last time. So I'm like, oh, let me put these in Obsidian and like just pull them apart into different notes and do that. And I thought I was going to do that. And that didn't work. Like I didn't get anywhere. And so then I did, eventually I wrote this one, which was like a brainstorm of like all the reasons, Right, I've been trying to write about this, like reasons why the Open Saga project I worked on failed ultimately. And I want to share sort of those lessons and help people sort of avoid some of those mis mistakes, but also like take benefit of the good things we figured out, right? Because there's some good things we figured out. And it's also a way, this is like a very emotional thing. So it's also in a way for me to like come to terms with it also. So it's like a mixture of like journaling slash writing lessons for someone else slash trying to get to something I can share publicly. That's the whole goal here. The whole goal here is sort of jumping back and forth here. This organization made by B our bump, the website's made by bump. We essentially shut down this site in 2014. So there's like this content here and we're paying for this and we have to stop paying for this eventually. And so it's sort of this thing where like, we got to stop paying for our Dropbox. We got to stop paying for this Squarespace site. We got to, we got to like close the chapter there. And all this has made me think and like learning about Obsidian has made me realize this concept of thinking about like how long should knowledge last. And so this is something I spent a lot of time on thinking about like 
you know, just going through my own experience with like things like Evernote and Google Drive and Dropbox and Dropbox Paper and Pocket, Apple Notes, like just <laughs> realizing during quarantine that I'm scattered so thin across all these different things. And it sort of just like accumulates over time. And like, you know, Nick's, I think, talked about this a bunch. I think a lot of people have sort of experienced this, but this was a stream of consciousness, consciousness, consciousness note that I wrote one day just in Obsidian because of the value of like just sort of going around. Uh, and again, I thought like, oh, I can turn it into a blog. And I, I didn't quite get it to that point yet either, but it, it spurred me on to this idea of like, okay, what I really want to do is create this open socket micro book. It's these lessons uh, that we learned and I sort of start to write it out. Okay. It's been like seven years since this shut down. And we stopped working on the open socket and like all of these are little notes. Let me do a, uh, I set up a keyboard shortcut option P that lets me pin the note. It makes it a lot easier to sort of like fly around. Like, okay, here's bump, here's the open socket. Um, this is an idea that like I've thought about a lot. It's just like, we need to be better discussing failure. Like in Silicon Valley and tech, they talk about, oh, fail fast. But I don't feel like they actually talk about failures they just sort of like encourage you to be messy so that's i feel like a misuse of the word almost it's almost like encourages you to be irresponsible rather than like learning from failure um and i like came up with this term micro book that i talked about and then where it really clicked was actually i sort of went back to a more traditional outline but what it let me do is because I'm trying to prepare this for public consumption, um, it starts to feel pretty natural. So let me switch to actually the uh, Obsidian website. So you guys are seeing the Obsidian website, right? So what I've done here is I've like modified the theme, like gotten rid of the header, gotten rid of the sidebar, um, just to focus on the content here, not uh, get confused with my like home notes here. So like traditionally I would have like a link to my home note here but I sort of removed it for the sake of like confusion here. So this is, I think a bit of what Nick was getting at also with like the, tr the challenges that you maybe run into when you're trying to have your own notes versus public notes. I started, I've started sharing this site with the, my collaborators, my co-founders where that we worked on this together. Um, and it's been really helpful for them to see this. And so to demo this a bit more, I'm starting to piece together how the site could be. And it could essentially be, I'm very much inspired by Obsidian and Obsidian Publish into what the final outcome might be. And it sort of further lets me lean into this idea of a micro book that I started with the Why Do We Interface, um, where I don't need to get so caught up what happens when I try to write a linear narrative. I always get stuck, but it's much easier for me like to write these little notes, um, right? And so like none of these are long. And this first one, why a website matters, this started as like a little journal for myself. But then later I realized like, oh, this could actually be the preface. Um, that's like establishing it for other people. Um, and there's like some standard things like, okay, I need to give some background on the material. This is less interesting for me to write and it's less of like a lesson, but some like background information probably. Uh, some of these are totally messy right now and, and they're not really ready. Uh, to be shared, but like, let me get to a good note. Um, okay, so this is one that I wrote recently where it's like a mixture of a journal reflection, an insight, an anecdote, and like a, a lesson on like working with press all in one. And it's like a few sentences. And like, if you read this in total isolation, it should work assuming that you've like read this like first page. And so that's sort of what I'm hoping that this can lead to is I haven't gone there yet, but what I want to do is essentially you're seeing like these things, these should all turn into, every section should look like this when I'm done. So it should just look like a table of contents. But what's powerful about Obsidian is I'm working in the table of contents, uh, sort of as like a, what we call like the, um, I call it hub, but we call it uh, the map of content. Doc. So it's sort of funny. This is actually like the, the first note, but it's more of the intro to the project. And then the map of content is like the second doc inside of that. And then these are my notes or brainstorms that I've had that I essentially haven't gotten to. So these are sort of my to-dos. It's like a really lightweight way to do to-dos. 
but it's not to do's because they're just like ideas and I might abandon them if I don't find the inspiration to write something or I've often been combining like three or four of them into one before I like uh, essentially write one of these. And so th there's like a lot here. And so let me, let me get to one other one. Um, so this is like a good example where I'm like linking a bunch of other notes. So what I'm hoping to do is actually make a lot of these shorter as I get closer to the end and link a lot of them together. So I'm trying to write these like the open stock was, project was incredibly ambitious because I want to use that in another doc like later on. And I, and I haven't quite figured that out, but I'm trying to really make these atomic to really encourage that sort of fluidity of me writing it, but also people reading it. So for someone like me who struggles to, with that narrative and like going like the, the intro beginning, you know, building up to a climax and a conclusion ending, uh, I'm finding that this is, much easier way for me to sort of like chew on ideas, find, figure out the insights, get on the page, um, and maybe at the very end, come back and, and do that. So that, that was a bit of a, quite a ramble, uh, and, I'm, and there's a lot more content here to sort of like click through, but that's the sort of like off the top of my head pitch uh, of what I've been up to. Okay. Wow. Okay. So first off, let's do our digital round of applause. Yeah. <laughs> No, this is, this is great. Um, I mean, this, this is why I, I'm just so, I mean, if there's a silver lining to the pandemic, it's, it's meeting people that are on the, this call and everyone else in the workshop. It's, it's just so ins inspirational in different ways. I think there's a lot for us. I hope you can keep sharing your screen because I do think that we'll yeah. have some qu questions for you. Um, and so, yeah, maybe we just kind of open the floor up. I was just going to say, I appreciate you kind of going through your process of where you've gotten stuck, how you're trying to move things. Cause then I, it sort of helped me think about, are there projects I would want to present in the future? What are some of those sticking points? What are some of these good ways that you're outlining of having um, sort of these light to do's of, of what you want to work on in the future without it being sort of that irresponsible, messy uh, process you were talking about in the beginning, but something that is a little more intentional and structured um, so I just really appreciate kind of getting to see how you went from point A to point B. Thanks. Yeah. I, I think I, I've struggled with it. And I think a lot of people str struggled with this of like, do you tag a bunch of things as to do or, or like, how do you do it? And I, I feel like for me, the most important thing is like being able to see everything. So these little tricks of like putting this in preview mode and, and pinning the, the doc and like being able to do this. And I've, this is a theme that I've like modified for myself. That it's like, it really helps me focus on like side by side, like just like two things. And if I like want to like hit this dock and the other one, I just, you know, know the keyboard sugar to open both. And I sort of like go over and like edit them. And a funny thing, I think one of the things I struggled with the most as uh, using Obsidian as a writing tool was not having any sense of safety in terms of versioning, but I just paid for versioning the other day. So let me, let me, uh, go to like, uh, this doc and edit this. I don't know if everyone has seen this. Um, but this, this, this is what I think was like the key missing feature that I needed to fully feel comfortable with this. Right. So it's just like, I don't think it fully synced like the, this, but it got the edit. Um, and it has this like version it saved last night and there's the edit. I just made at 5 29 PM. So like, that's what gives me, I think the comfort of like fully working in here to play around with my ideas and not worry about like making backups or anything like that. I think if I go back, where did it go? I think it finished backing up. Yeah, so now it has to edit this. Um, so I think that's gonna be huge. That's, uh, am I right? That's through Obsidian Sync? Yeah, exactly. So they just released Obsidian Sync it might be not the public version of Obsidian, it might be the insider build. But yeah, that's like their built in where you pay Obsidian $4 a month and they sync the, everything for you. We were just having some conversations about sync and, and the versioning is kind of that under, I don't know if it's underrated, it's just when you think of sync, you think of you know between devices and versioning is part of sync though. And that's, I have to remind myself that because that's extremely valuable. Yeah. They, uh... 
uh, when I went through it earlier today and read the, the Obsidian post on the information uh, uh, about Sync, that versioning, they, they keep those versions up to a year. And then after that, I think they start rolling off. So uh, that's, that's awesome. Be, I mean, a year is a long time, but you know, if you need to go back beyond a year, it might be something to think about. Something. Yeah, for me, I think I'm typically trying to go back a few minutes or a day or two. Yeah. I think it's really about me like copy pasting content and moving it around and being able to like tear things apart and build it back together. That's where I don't need to worry so much about these things. Cause when I, when I talked about here, I had um, this first draft. These were like the linear chapters, you know, not, uh, let me open up a better one. These are not written in this sort of atomic style. This is just like how you would imagine writing in like a word doc or something. Um, I felt like it was, although it was nice visually to write in Obsidian like this, I didn't have any of the security that I have with a lot of other tools where I can do comments, track changes, anything else. So I was sort of missing that comfort to just like edit this whole thing in Obsidian. It, it was almost uncomfortable. As good as it is in editing small things, it was bad at doing this. And so that's why that versioning gives me the comfort of like, oh, I can freely edit this because I don't need to worry about losing a good idea. Right. So one question I have, and, and if this is not the right or proper analogy, then you could just dismiss my question. That's perfectly fine. But um, did you draw any inspiration in, in developing this micro book concept from Andy Matuzak's website about evergreen notes? A absolutely. Yeah, definitely from that, from what we've been learning in this course, from just the way Obsidian is, is structured. But I also, there's there's books I've read, they're business books. And so like, they might not really be relevant for everyone, but there's a, a team called, uh, um, or the book is called Rework and it's by this company called 37 Signals. So yeah. it's like a really bold business book, but uh, I, I read it years ago and I always loved how short it was, like each section it was, there's no fluff to it. You weren't reading these like huge chapters, you just like read a page or two of this like insight that they have. And that yeah. always stuck with me. And then recently I read another book. I think I write about it in the micro book article. Maybe I, I don't. Oh, I think I know where it is. Uh, this, yeah, this is where I'm like on the spot. But uh, there's this book called Silence in the Age of Noise. Um, so, yeah, the thing I really like about this is that he is essentially reflecting on what is silence 33 times. It's like as if someone wrote 33 journal entries on what is silence to him. Uh, and so I, I really, really enjoyed that, that book. And, and you see, like, I tend to keep my personal notes, like, uh, really small here. I'm not trying to build a Wikipedia for myself here. I'm really trying to build my own ideas. So for this book, it was just like a way for me to talk about it. Um, but this this book uh, is a phenomenal book. And there again, it's like each chapter is just like, you know, two, four pages, most, maybe one page for a lot of them. I think it, there's a few reasons why I like it, because it's, it's very readable, but it's also a lot more approachable for me as a writer that's not very good at writing books to try and imagine that I might be able to write a book one day if I, if I keep it like that. One of the things I was struck by Andy Methuselah's website is, I, you know, it was interesting and fascinating and, and, and mesmerizing, but I always had the sense that I had to wander around, which is, is, is good and cool and everything. But what I like about your, what you're doing here is with this micro book is, you're, you're going to invite me into your website and you're going to curate your links like uh, Nick has been saying, and you're going to guide my attention and, and give me a course and path through what you're trying to say and do. And I, I think this is very impressive. I, I, I really like what I see here. Thanks. I appreciate it. Yeah, I think, I think Andy's uh, site is really cool. I don't think it's trying to even be a cohesive thing. I think that's the beauty of it. His, 
I think this is a little different. I think I might do other projects that are like that about like design in general, but this is to me a, a case study. So how would you do a case study? Case studies tend to be linear in their sense, but if it was linear, I would maybe lose this, you know, ability to like um, capture like this insight, like a pretty bold claim, like why you should always charge money for charitable, you know, services. Uh, and I sort of like have this, like, you know, basically saying like, you should charge it even a dollar or not even charge it, but ask it, encourage people to, to uh, contribute if they can. And just even asking them that question and getting them to think about it will sometimes get people to turn down, even if it's a totally optional contribution. And so there's just these like various lessons we learned along the way that at least for me are a lot harder to turn into a, a narrative. And so I think, yeah, that that's why it's so appealing. As you guys can tell though, it's still very overwhelming because there's still so much here. And so I think I made a lot of good progress. I took a week off during Thanksgiving and I made a ton of progress. That's where a lot of this is coming from. And then I sort of like, I sort of hit a wall again, another wall. And so I think I have to break past the sec this new wall that I've encountered again, but I'm trying to do it by, I've started to share this, like I said, with some of my former coworkers who worked on this and that discussion and like that feedback is what's helping me sort of like break through, I hope this, this next phase. Yeah, this is, this is phenomenal. And really like how you're, you're explaining your process too. This is a personal thing, like you said, and you, there's a, there are emotional attachments. So it does make sense that, you know, when you have these sticking points, one solution is to talk it out with, with people, including those who are involved. Um, I really like, really like how you have the intro and then the intro leads to, um, to a table of content, to a, an MOC, a hub note, um, quite independently, um, the light kit ended up having something similar because I think I started to wonder, well, how can I provide somebody a soft landing point, you know, like somewhere where they can get a sense of their bearings uh, without being overwhelmed. And, you know, so, so I think what you do, it really does that um, on a very high level. And then when they're ready, they can jump in and see like, okay, now we're here. And, and, then, and then how you have your categories laid out pretty naturally at the start, right? We kind of have these, there's a sense of um, chronology. We go pref preface, introduction, and then we go kind of more topically. And, and maybe that is still um, in, in the path that is chronological, or maybe not, uh, you know, at this point, you would be the one who knows best, but it's, it's just really nice to see. Another thing I'd like to also say is I love how you're going from, you know, th this is your to do, and it's all sort of in front of you. Um, and then as things get tightened, they become just the link. And it's just a very, it, it's, I mean, the things that you're doing here, I, I find that I jive almost a hundred percent with, you know, how I've been working as well. And it, it's, it's just kind of great to see this in, inspiration. Thanks. Yeah. I appreciate that. Um, and, yeah. And as you're seeing it, it's, it is sort of that chronology. Um, and some of these things, I'm not sure yet if they'll, they'll live on. And I sort of get stronger again at the, at the end here. Um, but for example, um, why website matters or embracing that everything should be a remix or how long should knowledge last I actually have nothing to do with this project, but they are my own things that I've been putting in obsidian as like part of this, I think goal that we're all after of like building knowledge in the tool. And then I sort of realized like, actually they're very related to like why I want to do this project in the first place. Um, ah, here, here is where I forgot. Here's where I wrote about, uh, silence in the age of noise. It's like, everything is a remix and embracing that everything is a remix, like soothes the ego a little bit. Like, you know, don't worry so much about like, what's your idea or like where you got it from somewhere else. Because like, I definitely uh, prescribe to this uh, idea that I think Kirby Ferguson sort of, at least that's where I learned it from. He basically shows you how historically everything in music <laughs> is remixed way more than you, you think it is. And then he sort of goes on to show how it is in movies too and how just ideas, we think they're our own, but they're not really. They're just sort of like coming from different pieces of inspiration. I watched every one of those videos. It was fascinating. 
the, yeah. So I mentioned Andy, Andy Matushak here as well. And sort of all these things I mentioned, I, I sort of did it from memory uh, and then I did it here. And that's another thing I can mention is that um, why do we interface? So if I pull this back up again, it's very, it has a lot of references. Uh, everything, a lot of links that are two references. But when I did this, I did it entirely free of any tool, meaning it wasn't from bookmarks, it wasn't from Evernote, it wasn't in Obsidian. I literally wrote this based on my own concept because it was a presentation, right? Presentations, you don't usually like reference things so heavily, but there were things that I remembered that I had read or influenced me and I basically pulled them together, even books that I had read. So th there was like literally things that I had read over years or like stories I had heard about like the Apple Newton. So there were things that I sort of like put together this narrative in my own head and, and sort of wrote it and then validated that I was like actually right by going and finding the right things that I was thinking of or doing some new research. But I wasn't, I think the benefit here and this is still with this tension is I wasn't worried about going and finding all these sources and then making like an obsidian note documenting that I know this piece of thing exists. I like wrote the thing and then I hyperlinked it all together, which isn't maybe the most rigorous academic way to do it per se. But I think the challenge, right, as soon as it happens, and I think Nick has been warning about this a lot, is like as soon as you have the ability to put it all in obsidian, it, become, it can become overwhelming. So I tend not, I never make, I never will do something like this. Uh, I'm just like, oh, I want to come back and make that a thing. I will never do that. If I'm not ready to write something about it, I, I don't want it to be a thing. I don't want there to be any noise about like things where I like want to tag it. I, I found that Obsidian search works well enough where I, I never need to like treat these as tags. If it's not something I really want to put knowledge into, I don't, I don't do it. Interesting. Yeah. Since I like brought that up, the other thing I could mention is so I thought that there, there would be a bunch of like um, spin-off things I would write about after why do we interface and then uh, then that's also when I started realizing that obsidian exists so here I had this idea that I could write about interfaces that press you know bias and extract and I haven't gone really far here and I think it's a bit of because I got overwhelmed of thinking I do need to start documenting everything I'm learning so it actually just became a dump of these links because again I'm sort of lazy and I don't want to come make all these different notes for all of these things. And so it's just this really long thing, which maybe it's better than the alternative of making a hundred notes here. It's just like one note. And it's just like a, a bunch of things that are maybe related to this topic. If I ever come back to it, I think what's more interesting is my own writing here. Like I wrote about how I feel like zoom oppresses you. And <laughs> I sort of reflected on that or, um, you know, thinking about nostalgic interfaces. Um, so that's, I think where the real value comes from, never really on, on writing about how something exists, but we'll see my, my big question is how will this be for me? How will Obsidian be, you know, uh, 50 years from now? And that's sort of what I, I ended up writing in here is like, it's sort of a critique of Rome and how there's all these like Rome believers and like uh, Rome believers believe in it for five years. To me, five years is useless. Five years doesn't get you anywhere. Like, I don't want to, I want this stuff to last a lifetime. That's my answer for how long knowledge should last. You see, the, your, your design way of thinking, which I hope design is giving it enough credit because it, it, it encapsulates quite a bit, is oh, what, what's apparent to me is that it's allowing you to answer, to ask, to ask, I should say, the big questions, big questions that have a lot of implications around them. And then you start to, to chew on how, how to answer those implications. There's a lot, there's a lot to di digest here, but um, what's really standing out to me is that you care about your unique interpretation to the ideas you encounter. That seems what is paramount. Um, less so with sourcing, um, you know, like you had said, and I'm probably similar in that boat um, it is, you know, you're not so caught up on sourcing everything perfectly. I'm, I'm trying to get better on that just, um, you know, to show that it is possible. But I think my natural inclination is to do a little bit less because I want to get into why I care about it and then go in that direction. The, the, the interesting thing, though, is when you actually are creating like that piece online, 
and, and other things. I would, my, my, I guess my thesis here is that the work that you do outside of that piece, it's, it's like, um, you know, when I was playing sports, I would do the same uh, repetition thousands and thousands of time. EDDs, they were called everyday drills. And so I was drilling this into my muscle memory. So in, in the moment that mattered, I did not have to think about it. It came to, you know, it was just there. And in the same way, I think if we drill ideas by, you know, working these, these thinking muscles, uh, critical thinking muscles, but creative thinking muscles, when the time comes and you want to create the piece, it's just coming. It's coming from that repetition that we might call intuition. And it's coming there and to feel, to fuel and feed uh, the products that we end up actually creating. And it gives it a natural flow and a natural energy that may be absent if we just try to link and embed these other things that we've created and may actually, you know, remove us from uh, a flow that we might receive. Uh, and that, that's the thing that uh, is, you know, the art of link curation. It's the art of creation from the work that we have compiled. Don't have all the answers, but it is a fascinating lim liminal transition between what is captured, what is what is written, and then what is uh, shared. Yeah, definitely. It was it was always helpful for me to hear you play back a, a bit of like what you saw here, because um, I, I think one of the things that we probably all ask and why we enjoy this workshop is like, am I doing it right? Uh, I feel like that's a question of like, am I am I going to get to the goal right? Is and like because it can be it can be a really overwhelming. It is for me like the messy middle part, like having a vision of what I want it to be. And then, you know, having these bits of pieces of something that's good. And then like, it's not all ready, uh, especially when I'm working on projects that I want to share, um, which this is one of them. Um, and th this one it, is a project where I don't reference a lot of other things. I need to find my own source material that's like lost in our Dropbox, like folders and things like that. So it's more, it, it further makes me think about like this question that I have like up here uh, where it's like hard for us to answer some of our own things <laughs> from our own own experiences, even though we were there. I, I, it's, I don't remember. Uh, hey, Aslan, I have a question about um, the, are you using Safari or what are you using right now to display this? Oh, so uh, right now, I think what you guys are looking at is my custom theme on Obsidian. Oh, okay. okay. Yeah. Uh, there, there's some like the menu bars on the side. Got it. Yeah, I hit, I hit it all the way. I like to work like this where, um, you know, I, I can pull these up and have it here. To be honest, I don't know if I find them that useful. Like sometimes this is interesting, but, uh, I, I tend, I think this would be more interesting if it showed me the connections between the nodes and it doesn't do that. Uh, unless, unless there's a way to do that, you know, I know I can like show more of more outside, there, but there, there is a way there yeah. is a way. Yeah. What's the way show neighbor links, um, and filters perhaps is that where it is neighbor links. Ah, see, that's, that's when you don't know if you're doing it the right way that, that could make it a lot more useful for me. Yeah, uh, I was really interested in the fact that you got rid of the, you know, like a menu bar and the graph and everything on publish just to make it a really clean, um, like clean user experience. It's almost like you get lost in essays or digital notes, um, per se. Um, you know, like when you get lost in people's journals, um, it's just a bunch of papers, loose papers. And that's the kind of experience it gives me, which is really nice from like, um, you know, like if, if I'm coming to get some of like Asan's like brain, like I want to really get in there and think about it and think from what level you probably be thinking of. Um, but I was just interesting how you got rid of the, the rest of it. And I think part of it now is just like, it's the extra is noise. You know, if it's not necessarily clearly delineated, like if I can't intuitively understand it, why have it there? Um, and, I, yeah. and this is really great, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think that's a bit of, yeah, I initially had it here and I'm still like, actually, you know what a big reason was where a bit of a tangent, a bit of a reason I stopped writing uh, was I started 
messing with the Obsidian Publish uh, theme. And I was trying to write this in my own CSS to be like, can I make this work? And I spent way more time trying to figure out some CSS things. And I just got stuck. I literally, this is the only time I've ever like spent so many hours on something like that and not <laughs> figure it out. But it sort of sucked away my energy because that's the easy thing I always find, right? It's easier to fiddle than it is to like make progress. Uh, so I found myself just fiddling um, with the publish theme. But definitely, I, I think I, I agree with you where I, I like had it more on the default and I just sort of like didn't realize why I didn't like it. Like I thought it was really cool to have the graph, but I didn't like it. Um, and I think you like worded it well as like, it just felt like a lot of noise. And I think what's really nice is actually these. I think these are really nice. Um, you know, makes it really easy to sort of get to other things. I wish that this was the default behavior in the software, um, that they were like just at the bottom here and I could just like click on them um, versus like needing to like open up this screen and it's like a lot, you, you know, like this is still to me not nearly as nice as like the web version inspired by Andy's Andy's notes. That's funny. I think it's like no, that part that you like to me, it's like, I want to get rid of it on publish. Like, I think that's noise on mine. <laughs> so it's fascinating. It's, it's really cool. Yeah. And you can get rid of it. I don't know how technical you are, but I haven't tried, but you should be able to get rid of that pretty easily. I don't know how to edit the publish side of things. I'm uploading my Obsidian um, for obsidian.css uh, form while I publish it, but I don't know if there's a specific publish one I'm supposed to be looking Yeah, at. so you can um, basically make a new file. Um, uh, to do, no, I'm going the wrong thing. So like basically it'll reference publish.css. So you just need to publish a CSS file called publish.css uh, and it will read that. And that's I, how I've uh, I've gotten rid of some things. I just duplicate it and call it publish.css and then fiddle around with it. Yeah. Perfect. Thank yeah. You. And you saw how I removed I removed that footer thing pretty easily. Yeah, I saw that. Thank you. Hey, um, yeah. one more thing. Do you know how to get Adobe Typekit fonts on to the CSS? That's exactly what I spent hours on. <laughs> oh my God. I'm trying to figure that out. It's like, I hate looking at a header font I'm for sorry. my whole obsidian like i'm getting into it but i really want the various weights right now yeah that's i spent so much time trying to figure out the font thing and uh someone told me they had a solution i tried it i just couldn't get anywhere I asked them the chat i haven't figured it out yet all right well thanks <laughs> <laughs> this is this is great feedback though for the devs um, and i think i'll do my best to remember what was said we have the recording and then try to give them some feedback because I'm sure they want to make, you know, users like us on the call very happy. So. Yeah, that'd be great. I think, I think there is this thing where like, if I'm just trying to share my notes publicly, what they have is great. But if I want to try to make like a little package site, it definitely, I think needs this like custom font, just a little more custom look. Yeah. It gets, it gets a little harder because on the fonts on the computer, you just install it, but on the web, you need to sort of serve it somehow. But it, it would be amazing if they had it. it would, for me, it would become worth $8 a month. I think as is, I don't know if I have many uses for it. So, so if we were going to summarize the Obsidian Publish wish, wish list here, say that again, like uh, Obsidian Type Kit or type, what, what are we talking it was, about here? Um, I put it in the chat, Adobe Type Kit fonts. It's for those who have um, like a Creative Cloud account and you can um, upload <laughs> fonts through there if you wanted to. And there's free versions too, like Google Fonts is like a free version where it basically it's a, a cloud served fonts because essentially when you load Obsidian, for example, on your computer, it reads fonts off your computer. And when you're on the website, it needs to load the font from somewhere if you're trying to use a different font. I see. So so fonts, um, that custom CSS that you did, you, you got rid of the side, well, both sides, and you just got rid of- Got rid of the right? header. Yep, and the footers you could say now you you also showed how to showed us how to get rid of those the links to this page the linked mentions so is that easy to do I mean I'm going to rewatch the video to see how you did that but are these yeah it shouldn't be a lot of this stuff isn't too bad if you sort of know your way around uh, CSS so sort of like find I think it was a uh, markdown note published container backlinks like I, 
I have enough familiarity with their CSS to know like that's pretty unique. And you're seeing that it's like highlighting the right thing on both as I do that. And I just did a display none, which is my favorite CSS line to write. I'm not that good with HTML and CSS, but I know how to tweak CSS that's already there. So from from that, you can, you know, it's funny, I would always open it up in something like BB edit or just another text editor, but you can just edit on the fly apparently. So that is a temporary edit. So that's like a preview. So I didn't edit my CSS. Uh, that just edited it in browser. And as soon as I refresh it, it lost that edit. Gotcha. gotcha. Yeah. So it's like right click inspect on. brings up like, uh, it lets you live edit the CSS, but it does not saving it anywhere. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you would have to go into your text edit file. I highly suggest getting visual codes and, and, and searching through it through there. Um, yeah, it's free on uh, Microsoft Visual Code. Is that VS Code? Like the one that everyone is kind of like standard? Mm -hmm. Okay, that's intimidating, but I'll, I'll give it a go. Yeah, so my, my current plan, I think, is to keep editing here. But then at some point, I want to invite my, probably my co-founders to also edit if they are interested. And that will be another challenge of, they'll probably tell me which ones they want to edit or like just copy paste off the website. Um, and then I think we'll end up eventually probably in a Google doc, probably because there's just so much there. But I don't think I could have gotten here in a Google doc. This would not have been possible to, I think, do uh, this way in a Google Doc. And then probably because I already pay for ReadyMag, it doesn't cost me anything extra to make a new ReadyMag site. And so I do think I'm gonna make it probably here where I have full visual control. What I don't get and what I sacrifice by doing it is how cool it is to like basically fly through notes like this. So I'm still sort of like figuring that out. Like, I think this is really compelling. It feels like a, micro book web style thing, which is a lot harder for me to do like that. But it, the question I need to sort of figure out is like, and, I, and I'm going to look for other things, like how can I make knowledge this last the longest? I don't, I don't fully have that answered yet. Question about, again, sort of getting outside of what you're presenting. Um, so I'm thinking about like, if you were to take all of your different projects, your knowledge library, would you have like a portfolio somewhere or a personal landing page of just here's how you get to all of these different products? Um, or do you feel like that's too much? Like you'd want your knowledge library and, and other writings to be separate? Yeah, good, good question. I'm sort of figuring that out. Uh, I forgot. I, I've been using Brave, which is better for privacy, but the one site it doesn't load is my own portfolio website. Oh, no. Um, let me load up Chrome. It opens up my Why Do Interface website, but not the font I used on my portfolio website. So this is my portfolio website. So I'm a product designer. This is how I get my like my jobs. Like this is how companies hire me. Um, and so like I have you know these projects here, um, and like I can show you guys like a picture of like the Open Socket project I, I worked on. So like. These are all here and um, I have these like subtle links and I have another, the first writing I did ever that was like really public was this one. This is my master's thesis, a bit dated now. This is a Squarespace website. Um, so this is sort of what got me hooked on sort of like making content and sharing it. That's like in a novel format and layout. This I think got like 130,000 visitors like the first year it was out and like 35,000 visitors and like the first like day it was up um, by sort of like getting on, on Reddit and, and these things. Um, and I've been trying to sort of see how I can do that again, but it took me, this was 2014. So then like years later, right? I did wider interface and that got like, I think it's gotten like 13,000 visitors so far. So not even nearly as close, but still like decent. But as I'm getting ready to publish, and I, why do interfaces linked here? As I'm getting ready to publish an open socket microbook, I, I am thinking that I want to redo this page to feature my writing first 
and then these other um, like portfolio projects and like the portfolio projects, I can open up one of them um, to get a sense that like, these are more like traditional case studies. And like one of the drawbacks is like, it is sort of slow because it's like sort of heavy, uh, but it doesn't matter because like, this is my personal portfolio page and it's like really heavy because I have a ton of like things in here. Um, but these are meant to be just scrollable and things like that. I'm really getting off on tangents here, but I think like the answer to your question is like the, the, the dilemma that every designer always has, the joke is that they always are remaking their portfolio. And then as soon as they make it, they, they throw it away. Uh, this has been around for, I think two years mostly, but as I write more, it starts to be less meaningful because it's not capturing that work well. That, that's good to know. I like haven't really attempted to do like a version of this. And I do feel like trying to put in things like if it was a professional project, a personal project, my knowledge library, that definitely feels like too much in one place. And so it's, it's something I'll have to think through, but I think that's useful to see how you've laid out uh, what you have there and then maybe what you will put in in the future. Yeah. I just have a little like aside to say with that one too, um, having no, a place no. that's like a link tree or a link page is a really great thing. Oh, um, and I wanted to ask, I don't know if anybody knows this right now, because it's something I was curious about, um, but like traffic, can you track traffic to uh, like your publish? Because um, if you can do that, um, that would be kind of fascinating to see um, how much, how many people go, jump from one place to the other to get there okay, um well, and then another thing is forward. tracking okay. between i wonder if you can track well, between well. pages or if it's just one yeah, um yeah, static yeah. thing i am I'm, I'm really curious about that you're you're talking about like obsidian publish right yes yeah i think that's one of the weaknesses of it is that you can't inject code at all like that would also solve the font issue um so i think in order to track that unless they build as a feature you need a place to basically inject code. And as far as I understand, I don't think you can do that yet. Uh, I do know that some sort of Google Analytics integration is is something they're working on. I know it's a privacy thing that they're trying to figure out. Yeah. Because I think once, I'm sure once you open open something up for code that, that allows other things to be um, accessed potentially. So I think they're trying to work through that, but this is a couple months old info at this point and um, you know, we know how fast they work, but I think they're, they're supposed to have some sort of, you know, analytics because that's been a big request from, you know, published users. Yeah, thank you. And one of the things I will say, the, the beauty of Obsidian Publish and the reason why it is appealing to me, even though maybe I, I, I'm not sure if I'll use it or not, is you don't get caught up in fiddling right here. I fiddled with this so much uh, and I'm like, happy with the outcome. But I don't recommend it for any everyone. <laughs> so I, I think for most people here, I would probably recommend Obsidian Publish over Ready Mag, unless you're like comfortable designing stuff. Um, even though that's simple, because it, these things can definitely be like a rabbit hole. If you've made it this far, bravo, you have enriched your thinking. What's something you got out of this? Cement that in your mind by commenting about it below. If you enjoyed this, you know what to do, share it. And of course, subscribe and like if you haven't already. And until next time.